Hard to believe that for basically over a year now, I've been doing the Yu-Gi-Oh! Retrospective series. And I say basically because, I mean, I've done a video and then a couple months later do another retrospective, sometimes month to month. But it's been over a year and it all started with my GOAT format retrospective that has blown up to like over two or 3,000 views now, something like that. And I couldn't be more grateful and more appreciative. And of course, these videos will slowly gain views over time as more people see it or if they get interested in in different older formats. And so I have basically covered pretty much every single well-known format in the game's history. And I figured I would end it on a format that wasn't necessarily tier zero, but definitely was an insane format to play in. And that is Orcist format. And I feel that because we've covered pretty much every well-known format, that this would be a great way to send off the Yu-Gi-Oh! Retrospective series, at least for the time being, until different formats become quote-unquote retro formats. And so I hope that you enjoy what will probably be the last Yu-Gi-Oh! Retrospective series for a while. We started it off at almost 700 subscribers, and now we currently sit at 1,236 subscribers within that time we've been posting Yu-Gi-Oh! Retrospective series videos. So I hope that you have enjoyed this series. I will of course continue to make it if different formats come up that you let me know about in the comments or as time goes by we talk about more history of Yu-Gi-Oh! And we'll do different videos on the history of Yu-Gi-Oh! Whether it's tech cards, cards that used to be played that no longer see play, i.e. Gore's The Emissary of Darkness, all of that and more. So be sure that you subscribe, hit that notification bell, and I hope that you enjoy this Yu-Gi-Oh! Retrospective. Orchest, the bunch of musical instruments we have all grown to love, is an archetype of dark machines. The whole play style revolves around utilizing the graveyard and having a lot of monsters on the field to link summon, from the Bomb Girasu Pass strategy of long ago to the IP Masquerina boards more recently, Players adapted the deck as the meta changed over time. The ban list and new card releases help facilitate some of these changes, but I want to talk about four major events in this deck's timeline. The release of Dark Neostorm, Bardiche's ban, Mermaid's ban, and the release of Chaos Impact, and how each affected the Orcus deck and its history of competitive success. With all that being said, welcome to what I believe will be the final Yu-Gi-Oh! Retrospective, at least for a time, as I feel I've covered every well-known format in this game's history. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Avery, and this is an Orcist Format Retrospective. Yu-Gi-Oh! Dark Neo Storm! Destiny heroes make their return, and Valkyries descend from the sky! Overlay to summon new Xyz monsters, and rank up the power of Cybers! Nine cards per pack, each pack sold separately. Konami first released the Orcus archetype in October 2018 in Soul Fusion. The first members released were Orcus Harpoor, Symbol Skeleton, and Brass Bombard, Galatea the Orcus Automatron, Longirisu the Orcus Orchestrator, and Orcus Treon were the first Link monsters released. Rounding out the set were the spell cards Orchestrated Insats, Orchestrated Return, and Orchestrated Babble. I cannot tell you how many times I had to do that for this take. Spoiler alert, it was only once, but these names are still hard to say. For the first few months that the deck was released, Release, there were many weird deck lists thrown out there. Extra decks were filled with any number of dark monsters, including anything from Wee Witch's Apprentice to Deco Talker. By far the most utilized dark link was Summon Sorcerers, released as a jump promo in March 2018. Although it required monsters of the same type, all Orcus are machines anyway. It being dark also helped a lot. With all those materials on the board, the Dark Link 4 of choice was Topologic Bomber Dragon. By combining it with Orchestrated Babble, it was possible to trigger Bomber's effect at least twice per opponent's turn. Combine it with Longira soon, you have yet another form of disruption. Obviously, there are a few problems with this strategy. The first being the field spell. If the opponent got rid of it, the entire playstyle gets thrown out the window. With no way to special summon monsters during the opponent's turn, Bomber Dragon just sits on the field asking you if you're going to finish that pizza. Another thing that made the deck not so good was the fact that the monsters, except Longirisu, have no protection whatsoever. A well-timed Ghost Ogre will dispatch the bomber effectively, and effect negation turns it into a sitting duck. By far, the biggest problem was Bricky Hands. This deck relied all too much on getting any monster and an Orchist on the field. If not, nothing would be done. Danger monsters helped us a bit, but overall the deck did not do much at the beginning. That would all change, however, with the release of Savage Strike. Konami released Savage Strike in February of 2019. It only had three pieces of support for Orcus, a level 7 monster, and two traps. Orchestrated release was mostly useless, being a monster reborn by tributing two machines, double reborn if the opponent controlled the link monster. Orchestrated core was slightly better as it could protect your cards from destruction. The monster, on the other hand, completely changed Orcus forever. 
Orcus Nightmare can banish itself from the graveyard to send a dark machine monster from your deck to the graveyard. Although this effect is pretty good, it was by no means the reason that Orcus became competitively viable, believe it or not. If you pay attention to the name, you will see that it has the name Nightmare. That makes it related to the Nightmare Link monsters that Konami released in Flames and Destruction. In fact, you can summon it off of Nightmare Mermaid, effectively making the Orcus combo doable with any two monsters with different names. Orcus decks ran every single good one or two card engine to put two monsters on the field. This included things like the Trickstar engine, Sky Striker engine, the Neo Space engine, and even Dangers. The Phantom Knights of Rusty Bardiche is a Link 3 monster that requires dark monsters to make it. It allows you to send any Phantom Knights monster to the graveyard to set a PK spell trap directly from the deck. This card alone could generate a plus 2 in terms of card advantage, which is nothing to laugh at. Decks that utilize Bardiche change with both the release of Dark Neo Storm and the April 2019 Balance. In general, both versions of the deck have the same weaknesses with disruption to the main combo. Ash Blossom Joy, Spring, Spell and Trap Destruction, just to name a couple examples. But both were extremely powerful. With Nightmare Mermaid being a thing, however, it was extremely easy to get the Bardiche out with very little investment in this combo. The first version of the deck focused on setting or searching the Phantom Knight's Rank Up Magic launch in order to summon Outer Entity as a thought during the opponent's turn. As a thought makes it so that your opponent couldn't activate any monster effects for the rest of their turn. It was an effect that couldn't be negated by things like Infinite Impermanence or Forbidden Chalice. Any two monsters would summon Nightmare Cerberus, which would go into Mermaid, which would summon Orcus Nightmare from the deck. Galatea would soon follow afterwards, leading to the Bardiche. Depending on how many level 4 monsters were on the field, you could either set a Phantom Knight's of Shade Brigadine for an extra level 4 monster, or directly search out the Rank Up Magic. Furthermore, Time Thief Redoer was the Rank 4 choice to bring out as a thought. This way of playing the deck led to the opponent being locked out of any relevant plays. Not only that, but if they did anything like, I don't know, normal summon a monster, Bardi should be able to destroy that card when Azathoth is summoned to its link zone. Unfortunately, the April 2019 Banlist banned the Phantom Knight Rank Up Magic spell card. Not to worry though, we got what would likely be the best support that Orcus would get, that being in Dark Neostorm. Konami released Dark Neostorm in May of 2019. In it, two more pieces of support were released, the Counter Trap Orcus Crescendo and Dingirisu the Orcus of the Evening Star, which made Orcus even more disgusting. The difference was night and day. Players also started using Phantom Knight's Fog Blade, which was a continuous trap that, when activated, targets a monster on the field and negates its effects. Not only that, it can attack or be targeted for an attack. Thus, the main combo changed to utilize up to two Fog Blades for the end board. As for the Orcus, well, we'll get to that in just a moment. Bardis destroys a card on the field if an Xyz monster is pressed onto his own that it points to. Dengirisu can be summoned from the graveyard with Symbol Skeleton. Thus, if you summon the Dagirisu to a Bardish zone, you can potentially get rid of two cards on your opponent's side of the field. Combine it with Orcus Babel, and you can do this during their turn. It was insane. Although other variants of Orcus appeared throughout this time, Pendulum Orcus, Lunalite Orcus, etc., Bardish Turbo was likely the best version. It performed well against most decks and was very consistent. Cheesy version of the deck was known as Normal Monster Turbo, stuffing the deck with as many normal monsters as possible. The Orcus engine and a handful of Phantom Knight cards led to quote-unquote full Orcus combo with any two normal monsters. You have ketchup and mustard, full Orcus combo. You have a dog and some turds, full Orcus combo. This led to the jokes of literally any two things being full Orcus combo. Unfortunately for all PK players out there, Konami banned Bardiche on the July 2019 ban list, and for a moment, all thought that the ceiling of the deck was permanently lowered. What all the doubters forgot, however, was a specific card in the extra deck, Nightmare Mermaid. Now that Bardiche was gone, nearly everyone and their mother began to run the Orcus engine. Rogue decks everywhere became more competitive by just putting a few cards in the main and extra deck. Not only does Crescendo act as a searchable Omni negate, Dengirisu is extremely powerful. I won't go into every single variant of Orcus, but I will mention ones that were popular in the metagame and give a small explanation as to why they were played. However, I will go into more detail with how pure deck lists slightly change as time pass, usually in response to the metagame. First up, we have Warrior Orcus. Although almost all Orcus lists play Armageddon Knight and Dark River, these specific decks played more Warriors, be it Gokis or other generic monsters. The main goal of this deck was to turbo out and I sold two Tales of the Noble Knights and summon out Armageddon Knight from the deck. This is an important deck to keep in mind. You're going to hear me say that a few times in this list. Cyber Dragon Orcus was next up. How would you like to end your turn with both a Cyber Dragon and Infinity and a Set Crescendo? This deck synergized quite well with the Orcus engine. Cyber Dragon Nashter can help pitch your Orcus into the graveyard, and in a pinch can summon Dengirisu from the graveyard with its effect. A lot of decks began to either main or side deck a Chimera Tech Mega Fleet Dragon to get rid of the Cyber Dragon field in one fell swoop. Next we have Pendulum Orcus. Pendulums on their own are a pretty good deck. The Guard Dragon engine helped them jump up to an even higher power level, allowing players to end turns on multiple negates. If you add the Orcus engine to it, you can also add a Dengirisu for protection or a Galatea and Crescendo negate. This was also a popular variant of Orcus. 
Next, we have Lunalite Orcus. If there's one card that allows this deck to be so damn good, it is Lunalite Tiger. While in the Pendulum Zone, you can special summon a Lunalite monster from the graveyard. While this is usually a once-per-turn effect, there are effects that can bounce it back to hand. Blackwing Zephyrus the Elite, just to name one example. And normal turns can use Wolf about three times, making an as a thought before the whole combo also helps protect against hand traps. End boards sometimes included Crescendo Negate or Dengirisu Protection, a Nightmare Griffin, and a Set Floodgate of Choice sent by Curios the Lightshorn Dominion. This is also an important deck to keep in mind. The Pure Orcus decklist, however, changed quite a bit over this period between the July and October 2019 ban list. As the meta shifted to other decks with new card releases or combo discoveries, Orcus players adapted to the new changes. One of the things that changed was the Trickstar engine. Prior to July 2019, the Trickstar engine was an excellent addition to the deck. Light Stage was a one-card full Orcus combo. Candina would search out Korribane, and now you have two monsters. Light Stage also helps with locking down back row that can potentially disrupt your own combo. After Konami limited Light Stage on the July 2019 team balance, players just decided to phase it out. One light stage and one terraforming lessened the consistency severely. Many felt that it just wasn't worth running four slots in your deck for an inconsistent engine. Players began to run the Tenny engine after this. Tenny Spirit Vashuda could special summon itself if you control no monsters, and while in the grave you can banish it while you control a non-effect monster to return a card on your opponent's field of the hand. Monk of the Tenny was the link monster utilized for the engine. This card was pretty good since it forced out some sort of response by the opponent, otherwise they would lose a card. As time passed, players also began to play Nightmare Corruptor Ibli. Alone, it was a one-card starter for the Orcus combo that locks the opponent down to being able to only special summon Link monsters. The release of Nibiru cemented its addition to Orcus decks. If used, the opponent is unable to activate Nibiru in the middle of your combo. Going first, the end board also changed from before and after the ban list. Prior to July, you had the typical Bardiche Dengirisu play. After Bardiche's ban, the end board turned into a linked Galatea and a Dengirisu with two materials with a set crescendo. Depending on what else you open, players can sometimes end turns with a Bomber Dragon and a Babel. Players also began to run Instant Fusion in the deck. With the combo and an Instant Fusion, it was possible to get the Galatea Dengirisu Crescendo board along with an El Shadal window on the field. This meant that the opponent was only able to special summon once per turn. Dengirisu would protect the window from being destroyed by Instant Fusion's effect during the end phase. In general, the going second board was just a Boral Sword Dragon with the Dengirisu on the field, which totaled at least 8600 damage through an empty board. Some people would also build going second variants that main deck any number of cards that took advantage of or helped break boards. That being Mind Control, Shadal Fusion, Evenly Matched, just to name a few. With the metagame in a bit of shambles, players everywhere began to prepare for the Orcus matchup. It was around this time that Artifact Lancia became a staple inside decks. This card was single-handedly able to stop Orcus decks in their tracks. Without the ability to banish cards, how do they do their plays in the first place? Unfortunately, the fun had to end at some point. With the October 2019 balance, Konami banned Nightmare Mermaid, killing off the splash ability of the Orcus engine. No longer were you able to bring Normal Monster Turbo to regional events. Oh darn, what a shame. Immediately, about half of the popular variants were wiped off the map. Cyber Dragon Orcus became much less viable, Pendulums took out the Orcus engine completely, and rogue decks that added the engine reverted to their previous rogue status. In fact, many thought that the pure Orcus deck was dead. Mermaid was gone, therefore the pure deck must be gone by now. As is apparent today, that was not the case at all. With the banning of Mermaid, Orcus players stopped playing a lot of the engines that required Mermaid to be useful. This included the Tenny engine, Instant Fusion, and Ibli. Tenny was no longer good because it left a monster on the field that you couldn't link away for Galatea or Boral Sword Dragon. Instant Fusion, although good for getting out a Thousand Eyes or Stricter Window on the board, was not as good anymore because it was now imperative to get the Orcus into the graveyard. However, if you decided to run it, it could still end on the Window board, it was just less consistent. Some players also took out the Sky Striker engine. At the time, the extra monster was not quite worth it. However, keep this engine in mind, it will be important later. With those cards taken out, players began to worry about other things. Obviously, every deck still ran the warrior engine of Rhoda, Armageddon, Knight, and Dark Grepher. They were the easiest way to get Orcus into the grave. However, getting any of these three cards in your opening hand was not quite the way you wanted to start the ballgame. Thus, players turned to two other starters that were kept on the back burner, that being Scrap Recycler and Mathematician. In the time after the ban list, players were discussing which starter was the better one to run. In the end, Scrap Recycler turned out to be the winner. The main reason was that it had no limit on the level that the monster can send. Mathematician can only send a level 4 lower monster to the grave. 
Later on in the format, however, Mathematician began to be more favored. The second most popular deck, Sky Strikers, as well as uh, other myriad backward decks began to utilize TC Boo, which limits the amount of monsters of the same type you could control to one. Scrap Recycler would block you from summoning Galatea. Mathematician was better in this case since it did not inhibit you from plays as much. Another monster that some players considered was Orcus Brass Bomber. If you have it and another Orcus in hand, you could potentially have a guarantee Galatea through most hand traps. This fell out of favor due to other starters being found, however. Along Along with the starters, the tech options were just as important for the deck to be played well. One monster that stayed in main decks from before the balance was Gizmic Orochi, the Serpent and Sky Slasher, a level 8 dark machine with 2450 attack and defense that can special summon itself from the hand or grave by banishing the top 8 cards of your deck face down. And then while on the field, you can banish 3 cards from your extra deck face down to target and destroy a monster your opponent controls. This card was excellent because it allowed Orcus players to push for damage with Boral Sword. Going second, it can immediately provide a threat to your opponent's end board during their end phase as you can potentially destroy one of their monsters during your turn. It can also help prolong your life because it helps block attacks. This monster became even more prevalent in Orcus decks going forward. Some people also began to main deck Nibiru. It helps provide board clearing during your opponent's setup and serves as the second monster for starting your Orcus plays. A really funny interaction with it and Babel was also found during this time. During your opponent's turn, if you have Babel on field and an Orcus in the graveyard, you can activate Nibiru in your hand, then chain the Orcus in the graveyard. By doing this, you contribute all monsters on the field, but the Nibiru stays in your hand because you're locked into only summoning dark monsters that turn. Thus, you have a Nibiru for next turn in case the opponent stops your plays. In order to deal with the opponent's babble, players began to run Cosmic Cyclone because it dodged Dingirus' protection. From the October ban list to now, the popular Orcus variants changed in both type and power, starting with the normal Galatea de Girisu Crescendo board early in the format. Konami's release of Chaos Impact helped change the end board and lead to an increase of popularity of other hybrids. This will be a rough timeline of Orcus decks and how they appeared in the format. We'll start with pre-Chaos Impact. The end board stayed pretty much the same. Galatea linked to a two material de Girisu was extremely powerful. Add an Omni Negate, many decks will have trouble dealing with this end board. De Girisu is able to protect all cards on your board from destruction at least once, and with the Orcus engine being so resilient, it was easy to come back from hard situations. A single top deck had the potential to lead to the game ending blow. During this time, the most successful and popular deck type was the pure Orcus build, since it was a bit difficult to add other engines. Decks with heavier warrior cores were present here and there, but not quite as consistent. Lunar Light Orcus was a bit more popular than other variants, but they got more power with the next set. The release of Chaos Impact brought a new Link 2 monster that would become used in nearly all decks even today. IP Mascarena. It's a Link 2 monster that allows you to Link Summon during your opponent's turn, using itself and any monsters on your field as a material. The Link monster summoned with this effect can't be destroyed by the opponent's card effects either. This was excellent for the Orcus deck because you could potentially use Nightmare Unicorn during the opponent's turn to disrupt their plays. With Babel on the field, your options expand even more to include things like Longiris to descend to the graveyard and Topologic Bomber Dragon to blow up the field. By far the most popular option to go into with IP was Topologic Zero Boros. It's a Link 4 that banishes the entire field as something a special summon to a zone that a Link monster points to. It returns during the next standby phase, prevents any player from special summoning monsters to any extra monsters under points to, and gains 200 attack for each banished card. Combined it with Gizmek Orochi, it was possible to get a monster with upwards of 6,000 attack on your turn. With a little creative maneuvering, it was possible to get it to 8,000 attack and attack directly for gain. Around this time, Lunalite Orcus began to regain popularity. Not only was it able to summon a million times per turn, but it could do it very consistently. Cards like Lunalite Perfume were able to get an Orcus monster to the grave, so that on top of the many Link monsters you can summon, you were also able to go into the Orcus plays. Decks like this began to make M boards that included Apollosa as well. The most important factor that led to its popularity was the ability to make Outer Entity as a thought during your turn to protect from hand traps. Nibiru is still being run today, so being able to deny your opponent the ability to clear your board is excellent. In case it fails, it was still possible to go into Appaloosa before the fifth summon to negate the Nibiru anyway. IP also provided an easy way to go into a toolbox of Link Monsters to deal with any problems. Around December 2019, an older version of Orcus began to gain popularity, and many would argue that it was the best deck of the format. Sky Striker Orcus is the Orcus deck of Mermaid's time, but with a larger Striker engine. Back then, the only two targets for the engage were Hornet Drones and Eagle Booster, Drones for Mermaid Turbo, and the Eagle Booster to protect it from hand traps. The new and improved version removed the Eagle Booster and added targets like Maneuver Afterburners and Maneuver Jamming Waves. Later on, Widow Anchor was also included. To take full advantage of the improved Striker engine, more spells were added to the deck. Allure of Darkness, a card sparingly used prior to this format, was maxed out on. Banishing some Orcus from your hand didn't really matter as it was easy to recycle them. Call by the Grave helped protect plays from hand traps, of course, and Upstart Goblin was a free draw and spell in the Grave for Engage. The reason the deck was so powerful was that it forced the opponent to make a choice. 
stop the striker plays and let the Orcus do their work, or potentially allow the opponent to draw a whole bunch in order to stop the Orcus plays. The striker engine helped unlock the ceiling of the deck, making IP Orcus even more consistent. Texts like Barricade Board Blocker help get Orcus in the grave if you open no starters and instead had a Nightmare Orcus or Hard Pourer in your hand. The Chaos Impact Special Edition contained two linked monsters for legacy support. Of the two, Scrap Wyvern was adopted into Orcus decks. Opening Scrap Recycler and an Extender, like the Striker Engine, would lead to the ability to start the game with an Appaloosa before going into the Orcus lines. Recycler and the monster would go into Wyvern, which would destroy a card and summon Scrap Golem from the deck. Golem would then be able to special summon Recycler from the grave. This results in you having two monsters in the graveyard for Orcus lines, and the choice of any Link 4, such as Appaloosa, before going into the Orcus plays. This deck was popular, but had a few issues. The main gripe with this strategy was the fact that it's all but required for you to open with a Scrap Recycler in order to have any plays with the Scrap half of the deck. Golem is a Garnet in this deck, meaning that plays get a bit more difficult if you open with it. However, this version proved to be strong in its own right. On January 17th, 2020, Konami released the first ban list of the year. On this list, many decks were hit. Most importantly, Harpoor was banned, and still is banned to this day at the time of me making this video. One of, if not the most important monster for the Orcus deck, Harpoor was the main reason that the deck has so many plays. It summons from the deck and allows you to go into linked plays easily. Unfortunately, this card was cursed from the start to hit the balance in some way. Cards that can easily summon from the deck don't last long in the game. Ever since this banning, Orcus hasn't done a thing in the meta, and many people want Harpoor to come back as they feel bringing it back to one won't do much. Personally, I'm tired of all the two things joke equals full Orcus combo, so this card could stay banned forever for all I care. Although, I say that, and I've heard that hitting that subscribe button and liking the video is full Orcus combo. And that is the story of Orcus format, and a fitting way to end the Yu-Gi-Oh! retrospective series, at least for now. I hope you guys enjoyed that video. This took a lot of time to research, and I definitely had to go back in the Rolodex a little bit because I was kind of taking a break from the game during this time. I had just gotten a new full-time job and didn't have a whole lot of time to play the game, um, but it was definitely a crazy time. I remember barely bubbling out of a Jacksonville, Florida regional. I remember playing Sky Striker Orcus, and I was X and 2 going in the last round, and then I lost the last round to, I think it was a mirror match, but... It was definitely a fun format, very combo heavy, definitely more modern Yu-Gi-Oh feeling. I mean, we're talking 2019 years, so only a few years ago at the time of me making this video. But I hope that you've enjoyed this series. I hope that you enjoyed this video, and I, I enjoy making these, uh, so I hope to make more in the future. It's crazy to see how far the channel has come from when I made my first retrospective, that being GOAT format. If you've missed any, be sure to check out the playlist, save the videos to your favorites, anything that helps you keep track of these and, and watch them all, you know, sit back, have a beer and enjoy. Thank you guys for watching and I will see you in the next video.